Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I am doing well. It is a great day to be recording a podcast. How are you doing over there? I'm I'm loving every second of it, Jack. We put a lot of thought into where we want to go with this recently as well. We were we're we're starting to get a little bit more serious with this, and uh, I'm I'm really excited in, in the direction uh, we're gonna be we're gonna be taking it. The most obvious right now is going to be the length of the podcast episode. Uh, earlier, I had advertised we're keeping it to twenty to to forty five minutes, and I think in the last. A couple episodes, actually, really since the first one, we've generated enough content to go well beyond that that time limit. We we definitely had to cut some stuff. And Jack, you even made a really good comment. We were talking about this. Uh, you were talking about having to cut out a lot of the character when we're doing these cuts to get it down to that sure. that time limit. Yeah. So I, I'm. I'm hoping we can extend it. I'm, I'm not going to say a time uh, in, in case we're wrong again and we have to, we have to, to tweak it. But I, I want to make sure that we have a episode that is you know both respectful of our audience's time uh, and also of their, their ability to ingest what we have to put out to them, right? I, I don't want to cut anything that, that is going to be valuable uh, or that will – will be able to to strengthen the connection we have and a couple other things around the ecosystem as well jack so if you want to touch on what's coming down the pipe and we can we can toss some ideas out there uh yeah sure uh what what are you talking about here with the podcast we're gonna get started with uh donations i feel like some a lot of it's back-end stuff we do have a lot of back-end stuff that we're doing but uh we want to as well bring a focus to the community aspect of this okay yeah uh, Yeah, to, yeah, yeah to engage with people who might have questions or comments uh, or, or just kind of getting getting a better feedback mechanism uh, from from people who might be interested in what we have to say. Uh, yep. So we, we definitely want to expand on the community uh, that we we build around this show, um, and and we have a couple ways to do that, and uh, those should be coming out soon. We'll we'll definitely be announcing them as as we roll them out. Yeah, and then the uh, other other thing I tack on there is uh, outreach, more a little bit more on outreach and getting the word out. So. I, the one thing I'd kind of toss in here is if you know someone who might be interested in the podcast, I'd ac- absolutely share it with them. Uh, we are starting to move to other bigger platforms. So right now, we just host it on the site, but we're going to start moving out. iTunes, Spotify, yeah. Stitcher. Yep. We, we, we plan on being on all those platforms to make it easier for uh, our audience to consume wherever they feel most comfortable doing so. Um, and, and perhaps, you know, even smaller locations like Locals.com. Um, and, and as well, it's always going to be available at our site. Um, with that housekeeping out of the way, uh, we do have a pretty packed show for you today. So uh, I'm, I'm just going to dive in, Jack, unless you got anything else uh, no, to, go to ahead. comment yeah. on. Go All ahead. right, cool. Well, uh, news and community updates. Uh, first news items we have is that Bookstack turns five. Uh, Dan Brown, uh, the author and primary maintainer of Bookstack, uh, writes a blog post here noting that in July 2015 uh, was the first release of Bookstack. He, in his blog post, reflects on the last five years. Uh, he has some very interesting numbers. GitHub stars seem to be very important to him, and he has just actually surpassed 5,000. Um, so if you need to show support for an open source project, that's always a good uh, metric to contribute to. He has more stats about code repository as well as he focuses some intent on Docker as well. Um, were you able to see this chart that he has in his blog post about his uh, user growth since 2016? The spike there? I have no clue what that spike was. There was definitely something going on at that point. It does show overall a very steady growth, so I'm happy to see that. Uh, it's it's obviously a very useful tool I found, uh, and it has a spin on documentation that is different than anything else I've seen. It's different from a wiki or a set of flat files or, or anything else. Right. He does have a write-up of his experience over the past five years as a maintainer. Um, he's talking about the, the challenges right, and his growth personally um, about... In, in in areas of technology 
and areas of community support, which are equally important to an open source maintainer. So it was it was really good to see the way he has grown over the past five years that he's been able to reflect on on how he's grown in the past five years. Uh, and, and it's just an overall good read. There's some really good insights there. I would definitely direct anyone towards that if they want to know uh, what they would be in for if they go to maintain an open source project. Yeah, and the one quick thing I'd add there is our second episode actually is an overview of the Bookstack service. If you guys want to check that one out, uh, we do have kind of like a quick overview. And so we do have something out there. All right. Uh, next news item here. Uh, WordPress just released their 5.5 version on August 11th. They have a couple of, of notes here, right? The one thing I wanted to highlight out of this release was their section on quote unquote the squad. Right, so they have a couple people leading this release. They call out by name. After that, they make a note to point out that there were 805 volunteer contributors just on this minor release alone. Right, That shows me what a gigantic successful community looks like. Oh, yeah. There tends to be a misconception of open source uh, where it can be viewed in the light of an individual maintainer of a project shouldering the majority of the burden right and i i think wordpress is the perfect example uh it's just been around forever it's a granddaddy of blogging platforms and i think something like 70 something percent of the internet runs on wordpress 60 something percent of the internet Yeah. yeah their ability to scale to that level of contributors and and to guide that community plays a big role in that success yeah it's crazy to think that just in this minor release 800 people were contributing code to it yeah. uh i also so i have it pulled up here it looks like 523 tickets and 1664 requests so if you think about it i mean that'd be about two pull requests per user also i did find it so that number of percent of word set wordpress sites that run across the internet i found 37 in a quick google search so i thought i'd toss that out there let me yeah i'll walk that one back then 30 <laughs> Would you say 36%? Yeah, 37. I saw 37 here. I'm sure it's 30, so, somewhere in the 30s. I'm going to have to stop referring to you as my co-host and, and start referring to you as my <laughs> fact, fact checker. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, don't, don't, don't do me like that. <laughs> No, that's 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 good to know, and and obviously that's still a a large percentage of the internet, larger than I think any other technology. So uh, moving on to our next news item, which was pretty huge, uh, and and sparked a lot of controversy. It, it, you know, not maybe not huge, but very very contentious, and I'm I'm sure most of the internet was ablaze about this for at least twelve hours. Docker, not the technology, but the company. Docker, quote unquote, has warned users of its plan to delete 4.5 petabytes of container images that have not been used for six months or more. Very ominous headline. Uh, So what are they saying here? Uh, Docker is rolling out a new image retention policy that will go into effect on November 1st of this year. Any containers that have not been pushed or pulled within six months or longer can be deleted by the company to optimize its Docker Hub service. So I think this got cut out from the last episode, but we were talking about different container registries that are available to us. So obviously Docker Hub is the one we've used. It's just the easiest to to get up and started with quickly. Um, GitLab does offer their container registry service, as does DigitalOcean uh, most recently. What what we're facing here is Docker, the company, attempting to allow its functionality to scale, right? And they have two blog posts that address that um, initially. So so not only was the image retention policy put into effect, but they also mentioned a limit on network egress. So we're we're going to talk about that second. And, and keep in mind, they did have to sell off uh, some of their company and downsize, right, as well. So this is part of, I, I'm sure, budget cuts that they are doing in order to remain a viable competitor in the space. 
to take out of what they have here is is the Docker company saying, look, we can't save everyone's images forever. That's just untenable, especially if they're offering this for free. What does that mean for us? Well, we have images that are built and tested regularly, as well as the upstream projects that we use are built and maintained regularly, right? We don't use images that are out of date uh, or have not been updated. That's part of right. the review that we do. Right. So I don't see this impacting us, and I actually see this as a kick in the butt for the community to make sure that we don't collectively become lax about our security posture uh, in containers because that is easier in a sense than it has been previously in that it's easy to push something up that we know works and works in a repeatable way and never touch it again right that's the default but docker in this case is is economically motivated to push us towards a better security posture. So right. I am I am fine with that. Uh, the, the other one, the other bit of change that came out of their terms of service update was their network egress policy. So uh, they implemented pull rate limits to Docker subscription plans that are going to take effect on that same November 1st date. Uh, the free plan, any anonymous users can pull 100 pulls per six hours. Um, the free plan for any authenticated users would be 200 pulls per six hours. Uh, and then their pro and their team plans would remain unlimited. I am very happy with the way that this company went about researching this before implementing policy willy-nilly. Uh, for instance, they have a chart here. And I know I'm being heavy on the charts this episode, it being a podcast, but go ahead and take a look at the blog post. They have a chart which plots a graph of polls per percentage of users. So we have, we have the top 1% of users and the top 10% of users and then the rest of the users uh, along the x-axis of this graph. And then we have the percent of all requests they request along the y-axis. Reading this graph, we, we, we can see that the top 1% of users account for over 25% of all requests. The top 10% come in at about 65%. And then the rest of the users, the rest of the 90% of anonymous users only pull 35% of anonymous user requests. So what does that lead us to believe? Well, that means that there are a small amount of people requesting a large amount of containers, a large amount of images, right? Docker is implementing here for the vast majority, no change at all. Once again, that's anonymous users. What you have the ability to do at this point is to sign up for their pro plan or their team plan, and this limit goes away. That means that not only are you supporting the company, with your financial contribution, you are also using the service in a way that is still standardized on best practices and is conducive to the way that you are you are trying to use containers. That's fine. That is there's no problem with that, right? All Docker the company is saying is that if you're going to use our Docker Hub, if you're going to use our container registry, if you need to pull more than the limit set in place, toss us a little bit so we can maintain our infrastructure and our service to you. Right. I think that is completely fair. I got, I got no problems with this whatsoever. Um, and I think this is actually probably long overdue and coming. Obviously the, the, the freemium model is, is leading the way in most application deployments f nowadays. Docker took a step back and said, economically, we need to scale back. Sure. I'll tell you what, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and uh, tell you, I don't have a few images out there that are, that have, that are stale. They are. I, I'm not going to sit, sit here and say that I don't have them because I, I'm sure every developer has, you know, at least one or two, you know, they just kind of build and push and kind of forget and you just say, oh, well, it's out there. And, you know, it's, it has been, some of them, it has been six months since I've touched these, these uh, images and you're right. It, it does become a a security concern it's it works i have it it works but 
hey, do you really want to be running, you know, the two two versions ago of, you know, Python, Python, what, 2.7 out there? No. No. So. No. Yeah. Good on them. It's these one offs that are probably taking up all this data for them. So, yeah, we'll yeah. see what happens. I'm, I'm sure I'll have a few repos out here that I'm actually just going to clean up before they get wiped. Uh, I, I'm excited to see them maintain viability, honestly, and, yeah, and I hope absolutely. they can do that um, through this policy change. And, and if that's what it takes, that's fine by me. So. It's probably terabytes of data they're cleaning off. Oh, I couldn't imagine. So many hard drives. Uh, and then our last news item here is that Gmail goes down for several hours. I, I wanted to, to pull us back to reality. I mean, I know Jack and I are IT folks. We know that stuff goes down, even stuff that's bulletproof. But I, I think the fog that we find ourselves in uh, can, can sometimes obfuscate that idea that there are still people behind this. There are still systems that are, 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 are able to fail. Yeah, yeah. That's not something that's going to stay up for, you know, 100% uptime. There, you know, there's really no such thing. There's not. There's there's three nines and four nines and five nines, uh, but but there is not a hundred percent uptime ever. And as well, you know, this is going back to what we were talking about in the Web three discussion about decentralization, right? This is a centralized service that had an issue, right? This there there were there were no alternative Gmail logins that you can could could use it at that time right now luckily for them it happened at like three o'clock in the morning eastern standard so it didn't affect the majority sure. of say american users right but europe um and and asian countries may have felt a little bit more pain for this as well these things do happen and you know they're they're really good at recovering from them as well. The idea of r around maintaining resilient infrastructure is getting better and better all the time in the sense that, you know, we knew there was an issue within minutes and we were getting, you know, minute by minute updates. So yeah. um, very, very good to see. And the more right. ideas out there, the better. We obviously have one idea on how to do that. Um, others have other ways of doing that. And I'm just excited to see who, who can come out on top next week and the week after and next year and you know next decade so Definitely. yeah uh anything anything else jack anything that you came across uh no other news here i think i don't know if it was last episode that we touched on it i think it was flocus yeah they came out with a new minor release version flocus is actually a next cloud plugin for managing bookmarks i think that's all i have Okay, and moving on to the development section. We don't have a lot here today, and a lot of it that we do have is behind the scenes. And I'm not 100% sure, you know, what, what value this is, but just to to keep everyone up to date with, with how we're going in and to keep ourselves accountable, right? Uh, so we are we are moving to a email provider that's going to be able to host our company email addresses. For those of you listening to the podcast, you want to reach out to us. Um, we have a contact us page on the podcast website and soon to have a contact uh, information on the rcompose.com website as well. Yeah, Jack actually had a very interesting setup um, that he proposed that we're trying out right now. Uh, to manage our finances with uh, GNU Cash and Nextcloud. So, Jack, if if you actually want to talk about that, because you, yeah, you took a while sure. to set it, that up, yeah, it's uh, I, I don't know if I'd say it took a while to set it up. A lot of it was just learning how to do accounting, which honestly <laughs> is not very fun from the stance I'm sitting in. But with GNU Cash, the one of the things you run into is that it's a local application that you run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not, there's no web backend to it. There's no, you can't just go to GNUcash.com, you know, I think it's GNUcash.org, but you're not going to get a, an interface there. You'll get, download our product and run it yeah, from, there's, run there's it from no your desktop. web UI to this. Right. So it's far and away one of the better accounting softwares that's out there. So I said, all right, we'll, we'll make this work somehow. So what we ended up doing was creating a next cloud folder and putting our GNU cache files in this folder and using the Nextcloud client, uh, desktop client, to sync the folders. Yeah, explain how that works. So 
on my desktop, I have a Nextcloud app that I'm able to use to sync like a direct it's, it's directory syncing at the it's, end of yeah, the day. Yeah, it's a it's a cloud directory sync, yeah. So, I'm able to point my direct I'm I uh, I can point at a directory on my local machine and I point to the our Nextcloud instance and I say, "Okay, this is where I want to sync my local files with the uh, remote with our Nextcloud server." And so with that, anytime a change is made or updated to that next cloud instance, it's synced down to my local machine. And anytime I make a change on that on my local machine, it syncs back up to the server. Yep. So nice little setup here. I'm right now. We're not. We're probably not going to run any problems with syncing as it's there's two of us. But I'm sure <laughs> down the road I can absolutely see uh, two people working on this and just absolutely foo barring <laughs> the Argonu cache uh, implementation here. But, well, Jack, that's that's what backups are for. So yeah. <laughs> uh, but it it was interesting to see that that setup. You know, especially for small groups, right? That just need a way to keep track of, of what we're doing. I'm, you know, I was, I was right. really happy to find a way uh, to get that to work. And it is a really great piece of software. It just didn't work for us if we needed to share anything. So adding in that next component really, I think cemented it together. Now, Jack has a integration discussion topic. Uh, today, we're going to do another overview of, of one of our services. Jack's actually going to touch on uh, Bitwarden, the password manager. So uh, Jack, when you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, so before I kind of jump into it, I kind of wanted to mention the fact that we are going to do we kind of changed our model up here for how we're going to our how we're going to cover all of our services. Sure. Basically, we want to do an overview of every single service and then we're going to pick one service, probably a major one, something uh, like Camboard or Nextcloud and do a full dive into everything that product offers, everything we can do with it and then just go service by service, probably about eight to 10 podcasts per service and then jump to the next one. And then when we're done with that one, we'll jump to the next one, so on and so forth. By my count, if we exclude portal and command center, we have five more services to go through. Okay. Yeah. That sounds good over here. You already know that I can talk about boards for days. So days. Yeah. I'll cover, I'll cover cam board as soon as possible, but I think, I think probably we'll jump into next cloud. It's just the most versatile offering that we have. All right, yeah, I'm going to hop into Bitwarden here. Bitwarden will help you generate, save, manage passwords safely and securely. Okay. Think of it like a book of passwords locked by a key that only you know. Make sure, I'm telling you right now, make sure that key is a good password. Make sure your password for this is a good password. The last thing you need is one, two, three, four, five, six. So there, there are so many different... Uh, approaches to creating a strong secure password do you have any favorites or uh i'll tell you what i've i know a lot of people that do the phrase Mm. it's like taking um dark side of the moon and lyrics from one of the songs and you know you change up a handful of words here and there and you end up with this 25 character you know password with that's no one's no probably no one's gonna guess but uh, right now, for me at least, I usually go 16. I think my passwords are like 16 characters, and they are just – so I'll use two or three words, and then I'll add in um, my special characters and my alphanumerics when gotcha. I kind of feel. Yeah, I, I'm I'm in the same boat. I think phrases are, are probably my favorite way to go. They're, they're the easiest to remember at least, especially if they mean something to you. Uh, now – I know Bitwarden does have a way to generate passphrases uh, if you need a suggestion, if you you know need something to, to kickstart. And, you know, obviously, if, if you don't think about it, it's going to be harder to remember. Now, on the other side, the average person's vocabulary comes out to something like 20,000 words, right? Which isn't bad at all. But password managers have dictionaries with, 10 times that or more right right right. so the the pool of entropy that you have to draw from when you're using a a generator like that is going to be a lot larger than something you you make up off the top of your head Uh, another approach that i've seen done i am not going to comment on the security of this but using the patterns on a keyboard to actually change your password 
Oh, that does not sound secure at all. It's going to be fairly random as far as the actual letters go. If you, if uh, I, I knew someone who literally took uh, from the Z key and then like up to the one key and then the X key up to the two key and just did that for their entire left hand and that was their password. Okay, fair enough. My one comment on that would be if you look at this Wikipedia page generated, I got 2019 here. It's 1Q2W3E4R. And if you look at your keyboard, yep. that's the first four right there. Granted, yep. you can make it way more. You can go complex, but uh, are you going to remember it? What I see in in this, uh, what is this, a splash data? They also got Keeper. So they, they've, they've got a couple sources here. But these are all either like three word phrases and the words are like three letters or less or, or they're like one word, right? Which is the literal interpretation of, of password. It, it's like the old, you know, knock on the sentry's door and, you know, they open the, the porthole and they say, well, you know, what's the password? And you're like, <laughs> blueberry. And, and, you know, it, it lets you, Let you that's, in. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that's not what this is for. And, and, I, and I think, I think passphrases should be obviously more more generally accepted and and as long as we start using that terminology i think it's going to be a little bit easier to communicate what we actually mean right this is this is your past phrase right use numbers use letters use symbols use use spaces even right sure the one comment i'd make on past phrases they're great so this is where a password manager would come in mm. it's are you really going to be able to remember all these passphrases? Yeah, how as you many? Go through? How right. many? I, right. w one thing I haven't seen a study on, and, and I'm sure it exists, is you know how many passphrases can you have in rotation at once? Can I have five? Uh, can I remember thirty? Like, and and that's a uh, secure passphrases. That isn't you know let me in or admin or you know how, how many how many of these can I actually remember feasibly for a period of time? before either the complexity of the passwords uh, start to break down or or I start forgetting them, like I, on average. So uh, I, I haven't seen that, but I would be interested in, in such a to study. To see how many you could remember, how many people could remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would guess it's in the range of 20, just thinking off the top of a complete guess right there. But I, I would yeah. say, you know, 20 passphrases would be like right around the number where uh, do I remember this? Do I not? Oh, this looks like it's for a different login. Um, in my experience, now I'm not going to say on average, but in my experience, people are already offloading their passwords, right? You, you have browsers that have built-in password managers already, right. Right? right? And now they're not as fully functioning as, as bit more. They don't have generation. They don't have revision right. history, right? But th you're, if you're already offloading your passwords to something... Right in, in this case, your browser. Uh, s take a second to actually think about: Is this working for me, and can I do it better? Right, and, and yeah. I think here we have a better solution. That uh, it's not an extension. That browser, that embedded password manager, if you want to call it that, it's great. But you're you're stuck. You're in one browser. Yeah. And I know, I for me, I have a handful of devices that I need access to. I have my laptop. I have a laptop, a desktop, and a phone. And I want to be able to access these passwords everywhere. So uh, Bitwarden kind of helps out with this. Yeah, kind of jumping ahead. So right now, so with Bitwarden, you have an application for every environment you're on. I mean, anywhere you have internet access, you're going to get but you're going to get Bitwarden, and you're, you're going to get it in a native way. And so, actually, even when you don't, but I'll, I'll dive into that in a second here. Sure, yeah. So the application range we have, so we have a, a web application for it, so you can go to your instance and sign into it, and you have you know, a website, a web app that you can sign into, and it's there. You have the browser extension that you can link to your web app. So anytime you hit a site, you can just hit your browser extension. Your browser extension is this nice autocomplete form, and it has a way to manage the username and password. You have a desktop client. I actually am not too familiar with that one. I usually just go web app and browser extension. There's mobile apps, iOS, Android, they're out there. And then the one I also haven't touched or messed with at all is the command line interface. I have used a desktop client before and I actually saved my butt once. Um, in, really? In the sense that, yeah, in the sense that 
I had actually gone in and deleted a password out of my password manager, right? And once you delete it, it's it's gone. How how awesome it is it that it's that secure, you know? But but, <laughs> but you know, in, in and in this case, I did actually need to to recover it, and I had forgot that I had installed this desktop client. I hadn't spun it up in forever. Uh, but what Bitwarden actually does, it syncs a copy to all of its clients. And you're able to log into the client offline. You don't actually need a persistent connection to the internet. Okay. This, this yeah. does work in an offline manner. So what I did is I turned off my internet on my desktop, pulled open the, the password manager, and unlocked it with my you know master passphrase and was able to recover that password that was in the client that still had not synced okay. to the most recent change so yeah that's awesome yeah yeah so i was i was really happy about that i will kind of step take a step back here i for the longest time i had a desktop only password manager i had keypass xc i'll toss it out there a uh, great service but the one problem I had was I couldn't sync it across devices. Now, you could do the same thing, one would argue, that we did with GNU Cache, where you put it in a shared directory. Absolutely. I absolutely yeah. could. Uh, the yeah. one note I would make is no mobile. And I feel like it's usually, mm. it for me at least, it's usually but syncing, between, syncing passwords between my uh, laptop here and my phone. I'll actually throw this out there. Now... I'm not sure how well it works in mobile, but Nextcloud actually has an application that can unlock KeyPass files that oh, how it about stores. That? How about that? How about that? Yeah. So you open. Glad you your, tossed you, that one out there. Yeah. 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 Log, about, you can you mean? can log into your Nextcloud instance uh, with your, you know, with the, your your just regular web app, and go to the the KeyPass application and, it, and open your KeyPass files with that okay. application on That's your sweet. Nextcloud web app. Yeah. That is sweet. So if if you really want to cheap out and just use Nextcloud, and this is why I said we're probably going to cover <laughs> it first because it does a lot of stuff. It does everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does it's practically everything. everything. It, it may do stuff in a hacky manner, but yeah. it, can, it can do everything. Some of the major features with Bitwarden are... Why, we, you, why you would choose this over a synced KeyPass to next cloud <laughs> instance would be so fine you're able to securely store <laughs> passwords with both uh this one gives you the ability to secure s securely generate passwords that's another just default yeah. password manager feature obviously this i notice you're able to securely share passwords within organizations which is a great feature especially for us because we manage secrets and we do use that uh organization feature that they have um, so we're able to share passwords between us, but he's not able to see my collect my personal collection, and I'm not able to see his collection, but we do have a shared view of our organization collection. Especially for us, we have a lot of admin accounts, I would call them. They're not owned by Andrew, and they're not owned by myself, but they are accounts that we do use for you know a bot that we have, and maybe he needs access to it, and maybe I need access to it. Mm -hmm. So what we're able to do is use the organization account and he's able to see that bot username and password. And then I'm able to see that bot username and password. Uh, also with API keys, I know it's not the greatest implementation, but sometimes some of these services only offer, you know, a single API key per user. So we just set it up for a bot user and we're able to use that uh, shared account as a way to you for us to both use that service. Along with organizations, we kind of already touched on it, but you do get the cross-platform accessibility, which is huge. Uh, with KeyPass XC, you can do that next cloud sync. I mean, there's a reason I <laughs> there's a reason I didn't. <laughs> yeah. And then the last feature I'll kind of touch on is the Have I Been Pwned uh, password check, so you can compare your passwords to the have I been pwned database to check whether your password has been leaked or if any of your passwords are have been a part of a leak, which is great. But honestly, if you're not generating passwords, I think you're a little bit crazy. I'm, I'm a huge proponent of when you sign up, just generate a password, open the Chrome, you know, the extension, generate a password for the service and save it immediately. Rotating, don't get me wrong, I am not great on rotating passwords. Uh, I rotate them if I have to or if I forget, but typically unless I see some kind of note, they they stay the same and they're all secure and they're all different. So I kind of feel 
safe there. Now, maybe, you know, reach out and let me know if I'm doing it wrong or if you're able to sign into my accounts because something was leaked and I am unaware. But for the most part, I absolutely think generating a password on the fly is the way to go when you're creating any kind of account. Yeah, and, and talking about rotating passwords as well, too, there's there's definitely the uh, rationale to do that you know, in the event of a data breach. But in June of 2017, NIST, which is the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, I think. Yep, that's correct. Uh, they revised their password security recommendations. Right? And they... They were they were going through and reevaluating their standards and, and best practices. So the new NIST password framework recommends, uh, among other things, removing periodic password change requirements. So they've recognized the same thing that we've known for a while. We the tech community is that there are way better alternatives than rotating passwords yeah right and especially absolutely. you know talking about really realistically well, how many secure passwords can you hold in your hand at one given time great right. that's awesome how many services have you signed up for so i have a number on that of the average number of services people are signed up for and i wanted to drop it and i think this is a perfect place for it yeah you know, what do you got average user signs up you have accounts with 191 is what mm -hmm. the average was Definitely wanted to toss that out there. A hundred. Think about that. One hundred and ninety-one different passwords. Well, not even different passwords though. Different accounts. They're probably reusing passwords. Let's be oh, honest. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, obviously, using a password that's going to be different. Not only am I only am I not going to have to remember one hundred ninety-one anything's, right? Is that they're going to be unique because when I sign up for them, I'm just going to generate something generate. random yeah. in my password manager. Yeah, with that, passwords are obviously stolen all the time. Phishing attacks, you know, database leaks. You know, maybe someone isn't securing their, how they're storing their data uh, or their passwords. So, you know, it's exposed. So with that, with Bitwarden, kind of a dumb little point here, but you can save time. Why? You don't have to rotate 191 passwords. You don't have to spend your Saturday rotating every single one of your passwords or having them send a reset link. I don't know, man. If it's between that and mowing the lawn, I don't know. I might... <laughs> Pick that one. <laughs> yeah, kind of to conclude here, Bitwarden's out there. It's a great service. I I mean, we talk about how we use Canboard all the time and NextCloud, but really Bitwarden, I would say I, I use Bitwarden every day for sure. I can guarantee I'm pulling up a, a uh, login information from Bitwarden versus, you know, signing into our Kanban instance. The kind of last thing I'll touch on is that digital inheritance. You know, if something were to happen, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't have anything drafted up right now, but, uh, you know, as I get older, I probably will. But, you know, putting a password in to, for all these services rather than, you know, just falling off the grid. So my parents, my parents have a little black book. Actually, it's a big black three ring binder but 191 accounts you think more or less. their 191 <laughs> accounts are all written down in there and i've asked them you know what happens when the house goes up in flames right, right. is, is Absolutely. that going to be the first thing you save right i i don't think so right, right? i i i hope <laughs> because otherwise <laughs> that's going to be very difficult you know but you know, their their logins to their their bank accounts their their logins to literally their their email addresses. I mean, I doubt that my stepdad has logged into his email address in or his his email service in in years, right? Just because you you don't do that once you have it saved on all your devices. I'm not constantly logging into my email, but right. I use it for everything, right? It's and we can talk about this in a later episode, but it is definitely a central point of a failure or otherwise, but it's definitely a central point. And I, I couldn't get there. Well, if, if something like that happened, they wouldn't have their password available to them for that. Right. That would be devastating. Well, how do you recover when you can't access email? So, so what does that look like? You have to walk up to a company with your, I, I mean, a <laughs> bank would be a little different because they have your identification, but what do you say to like, you know, some of these email providers, Oh, I'm actually the person, you know, this is actually my account. You can't just call support and say that, you no. know, no. So hopefully you have recovery options set up. You just don't have any options. 
that's all I have. I have a couple links down there. Check out Bitwarden and please, 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 please. Do not like, do not use the same password for everything. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's it. That's all we ask. I have a grab bag topic this episode, and this is actually coming from a book that I just finished called What's Best Next. The the tagline for that is it, it, it shows us how to understand our productivity, work, and the things we do every day in relation to God's purposes. So so this is a Christian based getting things done. Uh, it, it takes us through motivation and it also takes us through practical implementation on how to be productive. And as we say in our intro here, you know, we, we are about uh, productivity. Uh, first and foremost, I think, is, is how we came to this in, in, in the first place. So to, to touch on that, and, and it's something we, we are interested about, I, I picked up this book that I had gone through um, in a small group setting before and, and gave it a reread, took some notes, and uh, tried to pull out some of the things that I appreciated about it and some of the takeaways that I had that improved my, my day-to-day life. It is based on David Allen's Getting Things Done and also Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So if you found either of those books effective, if you've gone through them, um, you, you might like this as well as it does have a, a gospel-centered foundation to it. Uh, if you haven't read those two books, I would highly recommend them as well. Also ad- advocate for those. T- I have read both those books. I thought they were great. So the and and I put these in order of how much I took away from them. So the the first one and I did put the the chapter numbers in parentheses here, uh, but the the chapter on like how to delegate stuff. He had a point of view that I have not come across yet. Now that being said, I'm I'm not a manager. I've never really had the opportunity to to work in a managerial position. Uh, if so, I, this may be old news. His first point, his very first point, I thought was was great right off the rip. He said, "We don't have all the time we need to do what needs to get done, but we have all of the resources that we need to get everything done." And by this, he means that we need other people too. Right? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. You know, we live in a society, as the old saying goes. In order to get things done, you need to work with other people. Right? That, that, that's right. a that's a basis of what he's going over. So delegation there is always going to be a critical aspect of actually getting things done. Right. Now, the thing delegation is not is is that it won't just get rid of unwanted tasks. The important tasks need to be delegated too. And I find that more than anything, this is what I struggle with the most, in that I would much rather hoard all the important high-profile tasks to myself sure, uh, yeah. and, and not go through the pain of having to entrust someone else to something that's mission critical, right? Right. And up to you know uh, up till now i've been missing kind of that intermediate where where it's like what is what does it mean to delegate does it mean to completely hand something over does it mean to uh walk someone step by step through something so it's literally you telling them which buttons to click you know what's what's delegation in this sense right and he goes on to explain delegation is a way of serving those you delegate to by building them up Right. This is stewardship delegation as opposed to uh, how he describes gopher delegation. So stewardship includes an area of responsibility, right? whereas a, a, a gopher delegation type is more of a wait until you're told to do something state. Sure. Uh, and, I, and I think that was a, just a really good way of looking at it. By delegating, I'm building them up and, and making them a bigger asset to the rest of whatever group that we're currently in right yeah delegating in the stewardship delegation type of way can be broken down into into five main components right in in order to effectively delegate you need to communicate a couple things to the people you're delegating to right you need to communicate the desired results Right. First and foremost, you need to let sure. them know what is what is done look like. And and when Jack and I are setting up Kanban task, right? What what did I say in the description field? That is where you communicate the results. Right. I, I need to I need to know what complete looks like. So first of all, we're creating those desired results. Next, we're communicating the guidelines. 
Right. And my, my coworker uh, recently admonished the rest of the team pretty soundly. He called us out and said, look, I don't, I don't have any bumpers here. If I, if I go bowling, I need those little kitty bumper bowling, you yeah. know, rails, yeah, 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 right? Yeah. I, yeah. I need those rails. I need those guidelines. So I don't one. I don't rabbit trail off into something that is completely irrelevant, right? Right. Uh, and and that I know where the general guidelines are that I can use to to get to my goal, right? And I think guidelines are are very important in in setting the framework for your expectations that effectively communicates your desired results. Next is the resources, and and that is definitely one of the major components to this, right? If, if you don't provide someone with, with the tools and the resources to get this done, whether that's, you know, uh, additionally time, right, or, or money, or even your time, right? If, if you need to sit down and you need to give them an opportunity right. to ask questions, to, to run stuff by you, you need to, you need to give them all the resources they need to achieve that successful level of delegation. Next, is accountability so the the accountability also needs to be there you know talking about sitting down with someone and and giving them your time right you also need to give them your energy you can't just throw something over the wall right and come back two weeks later and expect it to be done right you need to make sure that you keep them accountable to you and that feeds directly into you giving them your resources in your time uh to to give them that that sounding board if they need it, right? So so having that that accountability ongoing in an, in an ongoing manner is also very important to delegation. Um, and then lastly, he throws the word consequences in here. Obviously, that's a very um, emotionally charged word, right? But we we do need to have a view of what's going to happen if this doesn't get done. Right. And, and also what what will happen if this does get done right if if we have a successful delegation right there are a lot of good things that could fall out from this right not only knowledge transfer and and you know freeing up of of everyone's resources not being you know susceptible to a quote unquote bus factor right but being able to to have someone who can uh, get the job done or or knows a little bit more about the 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 big picture right now they've been exposed to another part uh, another aspect of something that they may have not had any idea about before that's always going to be beneficial if someone can see more uh, framework around what they're actually doing you know whether it be you know serving in your your community or whether it be at your job or you know simply you know me me and my roommate you know figuring out you know i i don't know when he takes out the garbage sometimes it's in the morning sometimes it's the night before right and you know being able to to kind of understand that and have that that openness right if if he needs me to take out the trash if he's if he's going to delegate that to me and i don't take out the trash the consequences are that the trash is going to stink for the next week right right but you know, it, once once we reach that point, once we reach that point where where he was able to successfully delegate that, uh, now I I can understand a little bit more what he's concerned about. You know what he does and and how I can serve him better. Right as a result, he concludes the chapter with with kind of throwaway sentence here. You know, saying that someone can't handle stewardship is selling them short. Because at the end of the day. It's your responsibility to provide those resources, to provide those guidelines, to provide the accountability so that they can handle the stewardship. So if you can do something and you're not able to effectively teach that, and we all know teaching is the best way to, to learn something or you know express your right. your mastery in something. If, if you can't do that, maybe you need to go back to the drawing board. Maybe it's not them who's the problem. So it's selling them short if in your mind – you don't believe that they can handle the stewardship approach to delegation. A couple chapters later, he gets into a very, uh, very hands-on topic uh, about managing email and workflow. So in his in his twentieth chapter, he goes over that. Um, he starts out saying, you know, the amount of information that we have to process can really overwhelm us, and I cannot agree more. We do have a lot of information coming into us, and, and it's not just email either, right? It, it could be someone, you know, 
letting us know that hey you know what what's his face is you know going to be off for the next week could you take over doing this and now i got to remember that right or or someone asking me hey can you look into this error that i found right um and and it's not just that either it's it's also you know information that we tell ourselves like if i need to remember to cut the grass at the church next week right i can't constantly keep that in in my head and 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 figure out what to do with it. So, so right. how do I how do I keep this workflow productive so that I can not only have a better retention rate of, of everything I need to do and making sure and tracking that to completion, uh, but how can I do that while simultaneously being able to direct my undivided attention to tasks at hand in the moment, right? Which is also very very necessary in order to be productive so he has he has a couple different steps here that he likes to go through uh and and i think this works for more than email as i went over but his step one is to to collect right so he says to have a capture tool everywhere for me that's my cam board instance uh either on my phone or at my computer uh at work uh we use jira so i mean that's that's how i do it. it's another board software it works the same exact way right i I have a backlog of, of things to do. And if someone asks me to do one more thing, I'm like, yep, sure. And throw it right back in there. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm able to prioritize that effectively and, and get to it as I, as I need to. Right. Um, he also has, has a little one liner. He says, and make sure that it's one that you like to use. Absolutely. Which, yeah, obviously. For sure. if, yeah. I mean, What's a tool if you hate it? You're not going to sign into Camboard if you hate it. Exactly. Yep. That's what a boil. I think I totally agree with that statement. I totally agree with that. I still think about that sentence um, every now and then because it's it's just a great idea of if if you if you don't like using it right and it's your step number one in your entire workflow, you're, <laughs> you're gonna have a bad time. That's gonna be a problem, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, and then he moves on to step two, which is process, right? Uh, he, has, he has three bullet points here. He says to process things in order, and uh, by that he means order of time received. So if I receive sure. something, I process it first before some I receive later. Uh, process one item at a time, coming back to you know having my undivided attention, attention being able to be directed at something. And then he says never put anything back into your inbox. And I have... I have beef with all of my email clients because of this. He's spot on here, right? In that don't put anything back in your inbox. Your inbox is not your to-do list. You should have a workflow that you process your inbox. Just like my chat client isn't my to-do list, right? My right. ears aren't my to-do list, right? If I if I know I need to do something done, I need to, to put it in a workflow and kick off that workflow. And, and right now, kicking off that workflow is putting it uh, on my board, right? If I'm using my email inbox to also be my to-do list, I'm going to have a bad time because I'm going to be overwhelmed by not only being able to, to look at, and we talked about this in, in lists, right? I'm not only just looking at what's coming in new, I'm getting distracted by the things that I need to do and, and starting to get anxious about that. Right? And, and the reason I, I take issue with all the email clients that I use is that as soon as I clear out my inbox, it says, wow, you've been super productive today. Go take a break or something, right? And I'm like, no, I've I have so many things to do. They're just not in my inbox. So do you move everything out of your inbox then? I, I move everything out of my inbox. Okay, yep. how about that? So yep. I for me, if it if it's actionable, I'll create a task for it and I'll mark it as red. If it's something that's not actionable, I'll just move forward on it. Because a lot of stuff is just it's signal versus noise is a lot of what I need to figure out. Is, yes. is this something is this something I need to take an action on? Oh, it is. Okay, great. I'll add a task. If I get to it, great. If not, I'll reach out to someone on my team who does get to it. I, I just know the work's out there. And maybe yep. for me, that's at least, okay, it looks like someone else picked this up. I'm going to either assign it to them or, you know, follow up with them to make sure it's actually in their court. I leave everything in my inbox that's in my inbox. I have my filters in place. So a lot of the alerts, for me at least, are moved to an alerts folder. Uh, and then I have my, like, you know, if something goes down, I obviously have that come to my inbox for me to look at, mm-hmm. but, um, 
everything stays in my inbox for better or for worse. And then I'll check it once every couple hours. So I understand the red unread thing. Um, and, and I think I take it one step further. So I actually have everything uh, getting sent to my archive folder uh, after it's been processed. It's not like I can't go back and reference it, but typically if I'm getting email, right, it's it's one of a couple things. Like, for instance, uh, during this podcast, I just got uh, an email that our Locals.com organization uh, was approved, right? So Sweet. that is part of an ongoing task. What I'm going to do is I'm going to literally just copy that email, paste it into the comments of my, my task on Camboard, and then move that to the archive. Right. Then yeah. in my workflow, I know what I need to do in my workflow on my board. So I'm, I'm moving, I'm taking the information out of ingesting it and I'm processing it into my workflow. Right. Honestly, if I, if I thought of everything else I had to do, I would be overwhelmed every second of every, I wouldn't be able to get bogged sleep. down. Right. Yeah. Bog yeah. down. You, you get that kind of paralysis, right? Like you, you just, just you, you're in a state where you have so much to do, just do nothing. Exactly. Or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. So I think, I think my way of combating that is to make sure that my inbox is on my to-do list and, and clear it out and throw everything into my workflow. There's a second part to the processing too. And, and I think this, this gets into how I actually process it, right? So I say for my locals.com email, I just threw it into the Camboard task that I have set up for that, right? Well, uh, what I implicitly did when, when doing that, right? I have, I have two questions that I asked myself, right? And, and he writes these out here, you know, the, the question is, what is this? Right. And, and what's the next action, right? And the, what is this is going to be, uh, you know, you, you were talking about signal versus noise, right? Is this, is a signal? Do I have to act on it? Is this noise? Can I just get rid of it? Right. Is this a new task? Is it in previously established task? Is it a two minute task? Right. So you got to figure out where it kind of fits in there. And and then once you figure that out, you know, what's the next action on it? And he's actually talking about processing it in the next step. So um, there are five possible things to do with the source of input. There's deleting it, which once again, you know, we do with that noise. Uh, the, the next thing you would do is file it. Like I was talking about, you know, I'll just throw it in a comment in my task and I say, hey, I know I got this email. Here's all the relevant information and links get rid of it as a source of input. And now it's right. located in my workflow. Uh, do it would be another option. Like I said, just replying to email. If that's all it takes. Is just do it. Right. Just right. go ahead and right. reply to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the next one is delegating it, uh, which we went over previously, which is definitely going to be a little bit more involved. And then the next one is defer it, which is not, not my, my favorite last item on a list. Uh, I would almost say deferring it would be if I if I need to create a new task, it, but I can't do it right now, right? I'm going to create something in the backlog for it. I'm going to put it into my workflow to defer it. Uh, there are a couple clients out there that have like a snooze inbox functionality. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that is also an option if you need to defer it, right? But you know, ultimately, you're going to have to act on it. One of those four previous things. The, the goal here is if you're going to take away anything, don't use your email inbox as your to-do list. Sure. Absolutely. It's, it's a yeah. source of input. And then if I had something to tack on there, uh, now that you say that or describe that, for my personal email, I do keep an inbox zero. Uh, I'm looking at it right now. So I have all inboxes, unread, flagged, and then I have my mm -hmm. SMTP. You know, I have a handful of email accounts that are all linked to this. And everything for me under unread is... If it hasn't been read, then I'll do one of those five things, essentially. I'll take an action on it. But, you know, it's good to stay on top of it because how do you know when you get an email from the insurance company saying, oh, by the way, yeah. it looks like you changed your password. Was this you? It's like, oh, no, it wasn't. Let me try sign in immediately. Something like yeah, that. Exactly. So. exactly. Yeah, and, and, you know, using my archive folder makes it just that much more visual to me. Um, and, yeah. and visual in a sense that, you know, it, it – when I clean it out, when I'm done, it's clean. Like I, I literally have no, no emails in front of me. And that's a good feeling too, right? I've, yeah. I've, oh, I've found that to be a yeah. good rewarding feeling. So um, I, I think it's, it's beneficial as well. You know, if, if people already have their, their processes, that's fine. Right. I, I would just challenge uh, anyone who is, who is using their email to keep track of what's going on 
to stop and take a second to say, is this my actual to-do list, right? Absolutely. Or or is my workflow housed somewhere else? Because if it's not, you need to reevaluate how you're working on stuff. And do we have the application for you? Can board, man. It's the greatest thing <laughs> since sliced bread. <laughs> so, chapter 18. Uh, he talks about harnessing the time killers, right? And and this is this is kind of once again intuitive understanding of of how to be productive. Talking about multitasking, and he actually has the TLDR right at the front of the the chapter. He says either eliminate them or harness them. And I was like, all right, what do you mean by that? Well, the first thing he talks about is killing multitasking. He even redefines multitasking as being. In fact, switch tasking, right? And switch tasking incurs context switching cost, right? Now, there's a a couple way to do switch tasking, right? Um, You can do background tasking. Like when you're walking and chewing gum at the same time, you're probably not thinking about chewing gum. It's just in the background. You're probably not thinking about listening to the music. It's just in the background, right? You can do it without directing any cognitive you know energy to it you're not actually thinking about having to listen to the music you're just listening to music that's in the background right the other thing and uh i I remember when i was growing up one of my friend's moms just did not stop she did not sit down she did not stop moving nothing she's just she's bouncing off the walls yeah Yeah. 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 no i i still don't know how she did it but uh she was always Refo- and, and he refers to it here as rapid refocusing, right? So she would do one thing and then move on to another. And I think the example he used in the book is, you know, uh, cooking, cooking pasta, right? Um, there's a point where you need to open the box and put the pasta in the, the pan or whatever. Yeah. But at that point, you got five minutes of doing nothing while that thing cooks. Right. You don't need to sit there and focus on the pasta in order for right. it to, to cook. you know, and, and maybe that's even background tasking it, too, if you're if you're stirring it or whatever. Uh, but that's not something that you're actively trying to, you know, solve a puzzle or something like that. That's not that does not require the same amount of cognitive effort uh, to, to complete. Right. So you're able to to refocus into that task that really only does take five seconds. And then refocus into doing something else. So if you're talking about multitasking in, in that you're good at it, you're probably good at one of the two, either background tasking or rapid refocusing, not actual multitasking because humans can't actually do that. Sorry. Then he goes on to procrastination and this hits closer to home than, you know, I'd, I'd like to admit, but <laughs> I, I have been known to literally procrastinate something an entire day and keep telling myself and everyone around me that I'll do something. I just completely will not. His answer to procrastination is, lo- is love what you do. And, and unfortunately, that's just not a realistic expectation for everyone. Kind of a cheap answer. Is yeah, it, you know, now, it's, now that you say that, yeah. It's, not a, it's not a life hack, but he does... Take a step back. He does. He does walk it back a little bit and say, "All right, well, in, in order to love what you do, you have to be motivated to do it, right? I mean, you, you you're gonna feel some sure. motivation, and that's part of loving what you do, right? So, so he kind of breaks down the three components of motivation. He says, "Okay, if if you're not loving what you do, you're probably missing one of these, right? Uh, and that's autonomy, mastery, and purpose, right? So, if if you don't have autonomy over what you're doing." if you don't have mastery over something, if you're really struggling on a task, or if you've just completely lost your sense of purpose and you can't see yourself in the grand scheme of things, or or you really don't think what you're doing matters, then yeah, you're probably not going to be loving what you do, right? So in order to love what you do, you're going to have to reclaim one or more of whatever you're missing there, right? So, so look for, you know, if look for the autonomy in the task, look for the mastery and let's look for the purpose, right? If you can find one of those that's lacking and, and reclaim that, that would be a, a good step forward in, in moving towards actually loving what you do. And, you know, l- maybe moving towards something else that you will love to do, right? It, uh, especially if you're looking for more autonomy, right? You may be taking right. on more responsibility, which will give you a bigger sense of purpose. You spend enough time doing that, you're going to achieve some level of mastery in it. Boom, you're loving what you do at that point. There, yeah. Now, at that point, if you're still procrastinating, right, try, you know, identifying any missing information or precedent tasks, right? So if you're, 
if you're overwhelmed and you, you just don't know where to begin in, right? Is there, is there a big gap in your knowledge of, of what you need to do? Like, um, when we were designing the logo check for, for the, the podcast, right? Yeah. I had no yeah. clue where to start and I put that off for weeks before going to, to Fiverr. Right. So, so I just, I didn't have the information that I needed. I didn't have what I needed to, to get that done. Right. Um, or are there any tasks that you haven't considered yet that, that need to be done before you actually do the tasks that you're procrastinating? Right. Right. The next one, chunking it, you know, breaking it down into smaller chunks, that's always going to be a staple in any productivity book. He also has another suggestion, which is interesting. He says, do literally nothing for a period of time, right? Which it's it's hard to do now because I am yeah. so easily distracted. Everything. Well, mentioned above, everything is grabbing your attention. Yeah. Even at home. Everything is grabbing your attention. And not just the entertainment, right? But the actual stuff that's important, too. Right. The actual yeah. tasks Absolutely. I have to do. That could still be on my mind, right? Uh, doing literally nothing, you know, if you can consider it a form of meditation, right? If you want to spend it in prayer, uh, it, you know, you could literally sit and stare up at the, probably not the sun, probably not a great idea, but if it's nighttime, the stars, right? Mm -hmm. And and just sit there and relax and do nothing, right? And and that may be a little bit zen, but hey, give it a try, maybe. Yeah, I'm no doctor, but uh, I would not just walk outside and stare at the sun. <laughs> just doesn't sound like a good one to me. It does not. Even with sunglasses, that's still not going to help. <laughs> Having gone over multitasking and procrastination, he also makes a point to talk about interruptions and making them beneficial. And this is a, a more of a psychology hack. Right. He, he obviously says minimize them when possible. He's, he's definitely more in the camp of um, eliminate all of your distractions and focus on one thing at one time. He does say making yourself available uh, outside of the times when you're you're honed in, you know, doing something right is is a way to serve other people. Right. And, and it, it could be also, you know, a, a benefit to you. Right. So if you are. You know, if, if you're interrupted and you're not happy about it, take a breath, right, and and see where you want to go from there. See if see if there's something you could take away from this that you wouldn't have had before, right? Or or see yeah. uh, try try to see this in light of an opportunity for you to serve someone else, right? And obviously that's that's going to be God glorifying as as he writes in the book, right? If you're you're if you're always looking to serve people. You're never going to turn down an interruption as an opportunity to do that. Managing email and workflow and uh, harnessing the time killers. I feel like uh, I read Getting Things Done and I, I came in with my own system. So I looked at his as like, oh, maybe I can take away something from here. And then, I mean, I, like I said, I already had my own system. So I kind of thought his was, I, I didn't like it. I didn't like the way that David Allen, David Allen, yeah, has his like, it's a very 90s system of doing things. He is like talking about file cabinets. And I'm like, <laughs> fine, maybe I could do this in folders or something. Like, yeah. fine, maybe I'll do my treat my inbox this way. But uh, the way he presented it, I, I looked at it and I was like, N this just doesn't make sense to me. And maybe because it wasn't, I was framing it improperly. And, and I'm not sure how much he took away from Dave Allen's book. But Matt Perman does have that same sort of, of getting things done system. Um, he, yeah. it, it uses a lot of to-do lists, right? And, and we've gone over that before, right? My, my objections to to-do lists and how they put literally everything in front of you. They're hard to manage. And, and I can see him compensating for that in, in the systems too, right? They, they have kind of a rotation going on to make sure that you're not bombarded by everything at once. Right. Um, and, and trying to break it up between tasks and projects. And, and, uh, I, I just think what, what we've been working on and, and, and the way we we're using Kanban boards and, you know, and, and the way Kanban boards make that information available to us is a lot more effective, uh, than the actual details of the system that he has here. Right. Right. Um, and th that's specifically us. I'd say, you know, maybe if you're brand new to it, this is definitely something to check out. If you don't know where to start, keep listening to our podcast. It's not a bad introduction Place to, to productivity, yeah. right? Yeah. So overall, um, I recommend the book. 
you know, obviously David Allen's and, and Stephen Covey's too. Definitely. I have to check it out. Are you reading anything right now, Jack? Anything interesting or? Uh, the one I toss out there that I always just like enjoy reading. I've read it. I've listened to it a couple of times here is it's a book by David Goggins, who is a former Navy SEAL called Can't Hurt Me. Uh, and he mm, kind of just I don't yeah. know if you've heard of it or read it, but, uh, you know, it was a little bit about what we went to on Monday, which was uh, Jason Stapleton's podcast webinar my favorite thing that he kind of said that i'm gonna steal it and say it right here is you are the common denominator of your life oh yeah so i thought that was huge and i like i didn't know how to frame when i explained that david goggins book to people i don't know how to frame that but i think that right there is how i would summarize that book what what you do impacts you your local community right it, it affects the people around you and it also affects the world at large right i mean what is What's that old phrase? Uh, think locally or think globally, act locally, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's that's not wrong, and there are some really big, you know, purposes out there that we need to be driven to do, right? Uh, promoting open source software is something that you and I care a lot about, and that's Absolutely, that's why we're doing yeah. this right now, right? Um, I think encouraging productivity, right? I, I think there, especially in these uncertain times. There, yeah. there are a lot of things that we could all be doing better, right? Uh, how, how do you get things done? You know, what is best to do next, right? And, and, and I think uh, being able to not only do that for yourself, but also the people you love and care for, right? That's going to help you there and it's going to help your community at large. Um, so, you know, if, if that's something, you know, that, that you want to do, you know, we're, we're going to keep pumping out these episodes, right? Um, feel free to, to tell whoever needs to hear this, right. To, to listen to the show and subscribe and, and give feedback, uh, to us. And, uh, until that time, you know, I want to thank everyone for listening and we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Composecast. Uh, thank you. Be safe. And we'll see you all in two weeks.